And I won't discuss the foot for a specific reason. The foot in arthroidosis is quite difficult. Right? We all know that multiple castings, perhaps as minimal surgery as possible for anybody who treats arthroidosis, we know we want to do as little surgery on the foot as possible, keep on casting every year another cast, every couple of years another cast, and as minimal surgery to make the knee as flat to the ground as possible. But the hip can come in two, hip and knee can come in two different forms. You can come in the knee flexed position, right? And you can have you can have the ability to straighten that knee, like have some quadriceps function, that's the muscle in front of the knee, to straighten it, or it can be stuck all the way straight in extension. And that's and that's the same as the head. It can be stuck in flexion or stuck down in extension. So here's one stuck in flexion. You see that usual position. It's flexed, the hips are wide open. Here's one stuck in extension, the club foot, and the knee is all the way extended and more flexed. And they can do both. In order to walk easily or more easily, one requires less than 30 degree hip flexion contracture. You require your knee to be less than 20 degree flex. You require a foot that's relatively on the ground. You have to have some bit of ability to walk right in your trunk. And maybe if you don't want to wear a long brace, then you have to have some ability to straighten your knee. And that may not be completely true, because of polio we saw people walking with no quadriceps, but we can discuss that later. You also have to worry about sitting. If your hip doesn't flex, you can't sit very easy, especially if some surgeon has fused your spine. So how do you sit? Well, you've got to be able to flex the hip up to 80 degrees. Your knee should flex down so you don't trip someone in the movie theater, and you're more than the airplane, and so you can find not something more than an ILC, and again, your feet should be on the ground somewhat. So in order to all speak the same language, it has to, you have to have a classification of this so we all can speak. So we made a classification including hip and knee, flexion extension, motor strength, joint status, and, what is it, and that helps with prognosis. So we call type 1 is when you have flexion, type 2 your knee is stuck straight, and type 3 of that is somewhere in between, that stiff knee. And that basically are the three types, and in that there's different subtypes, and in that you can say whether or not, they, what's the hip doing? What is the hip doing? Is it flexed? Is it normal? Or is it stuck in extension? And for me, and I, I know how I want to be here with next door, I think you should treat the hip and the knee at the same time. You shouldn't separate or connect it, because one is making the other happen. So if your knee is flexed, and you're stuck in that, you know, that frog position, then of course your hip won't come in, because that's the only way you're going to sit. So basically, for me, we have to treat the hip and the knee simultaneously, and I will prove it. So here's how I do it, and here's what I think is new. So in 2007, Dr. Boss and I wrote an article that it, to straighten the arthrogrypotic knee, you put a fixator on it, you straighten the knee, and in that article we wrote that you don't increase the arc of motion. Right? We wrote that article, it was published in JBJS, which is one of the orthopedic journals, and it said that if anything, we lost some motion. And believe me, if we said we lost five degrees of motion, we probably lost a lot more than that. And we were creating stiff knees, and I never liked it. So from 2010 and on, I tried to find a solution that didn't include putting a fixator on the knee, solved the problem in 2015, and I'm presenting this probably four times in the next three months, so hopefully someone will believe me finally. So how do you do that? How do you make a knee go from this 90 degree position to this extended position in one operation? I can't, I, I can't say it's a small scar, but it's not. One operation, one sitting, and it moves afterwards. So here, two weeks apart, okay? I just did this knee on that day. Two weeks before, I did this knee, which was 90 degree flex, as you just saw. And here's the knee. So that's two weeks later. I feel like I'm like laser spine institute. I, I, I'm telling you it's the truth. Anyway, you can believe me or not. That's what I just did, which is actually just a little bit more. It was stiff right after you do it, and a couple weeks later. 90 degree, this is a 90 degree flexion contraction. This is the most the knee will move. And that is the knee after. So no fixator. This is a girl who bilateral 90 degree flexion contractures, did my best to hide her identity. The problem is you all know each other. But the, the, here it is, this is her mother moving her knee, and this is six weeks after surgery, four to six weeks after surgery. So it's not just me doing it, that's her mom doing the exercises. I move all three at the same time, 
And this is six weeks after surgery, for the first time, we're trying to walk. Now her knees, her foot is internally rotated, we can take care of that. I'm not saying there are other issues to take care of, but all of it requires an increase in the arc of motion. So she started at 90 to 125, she's now zero to 90. That's a 35 degree arc of motion going to 90 degree arc of motion. So it can be done, and it is done, and I've done now 50 or 60 cases, and they do work, but it can be done. So what do you do? Well, you need everybody. You need the physiotherapist, like Dr. Hall said, you need to cast, you need to brace, and then we do all these procedures. And everybody's wondering, what is this thing about the nerves? What are we talking about the nerves? And I'll get to that in a minute, and I'll show some disgusting pictures. But basically, this is what we do. We basically, we, we release the knee completely. But the biggest thing I'm doing is we're shortening the femur. That's been written about years ago, but they shortened it in the wrong place. They shortened it by the knee, which ruined the knee and could not straighten the knee. They didn't straighten, they didn't shorten it by the hip. And it doesn't matter that you shorten it, it doesn't weaken it. I could always lengthen it, well, that's the institute I'm in. All we do is lengthen the bones. But basically, that's not the problem. The issue is it shortens everything. So it shortens the artery, which is the blood vessel. It shortens the nerves. It allows things to breathe. It doesn't kill the leg. And that's where we're going to get you now. And obviously, physiotherapy is a major point in all of this. And we have amazing physical therapists, Ryan, and they are doing incredible work. So serial casting, does it work for everybody? No. If your knee is dislocated, don't serial cast. It's just going to ruin the cartilage. But if your knee is located, then yes. If you're stuck in extension, maybe you can cast it into flexion a little bit. If you're a little bit flexed, maybe you could extend it a little bit. And bracing, you guys know bracing better than I do. I'm not going to sit here and talk about bracing. So basically, because you've been through it all, you've got closets full of braces. And here's what we release, the hamstrings, the gastrocnemius, the tensor fascia lata, the pterygium, the capsule, the ACL, PC, all of these are fancy words, but I'll show you. What about this? What about guided growth for the knee, which I'm sure people have heard? Yes, you can do that, but it has to be very little, less than 25 degrees. Otherwise, it's not going to straighten, or the thing's just going to go into the bone and cause more problems. So the answer for everything is not just guided growth, although it's certainly one type. So what nerves do we loosen up? What nerves do I release, not cut? The loosen from their tethers. The sciatic nerve, the perineal nerve, all the branches of it, and I loosen up the fascia. And I will show you pictures of what that looks like in a patient with a pterygium syndrome if you don't want to close your eyes. And I open up the joints. So this is a pub, you know, it's been published that you first have to get the hips under the body before you get the knees straight. That is not the case. You don't have to do that. It will come around. In fact, if you do that, what you're doing is you're shortening the muscle that connects to the pelvis, and then when I go in, I have to lengthen that muscle by lengthening the pelvis, which makes it much more difficult to do. So you don't have to do that. Why not just do it in the knee, straight in the knee and the lower? Well, first of all, if you do that in a child, literally in one year, it'll be flexed again. One year, your knee will be flexed again. If you do it in an adult, there's only so much you can do. You can't straighten the 90 degree contracture. It just, it just basically ruins the artery. So I will show you why shortening works and how much you can actually do if you're willing to keep your eyes open. So why, why do I shorten all the way by the hip? It's a lever arm, right? All of you on a seesaw, you can't pull the knee straight, right? Unless you're far away from it holding it. So if I hold the bone on the femur bone all the way up by the hip, and I will lever arm like a seesaw to straighten the knee. And one father wants to see that exact moment. He was obviously an engineer. He made me videotape the exact moment I brought his daughter from 90 degrees to straight. It's actually a video I showed you. Um, how much do I short? As enough as it is to make it straight. So how did this happen? How did I get to come to this? This is the, this is the case. This is the case that made this happen. This is a young man from Italy, could barely walk, and on one side did an external fixator, and on one side I did this technique. And on one side he had a stiff straight knee, and on the other knee he could bend it. And this was in 2000, I think, either in six or seven, and this was him when he, when he came in. He had to be held up to walk. And we went back to Italy. And that's what I did. I think many of you had it, or many of you not had it, but that's how you straightened the knee with a fixator. 
I called for past treatment. I did a webinar where someone got really mad at me for calling this the past treatment. Too bad. Um, but basically, this is the way I used to treat it, and I know how to do it. I mean, we, we actually figured this out together. So, and he went home, and he walked. He wanted his mom to hold his shirt, and after this, he walked to school alone, but this was before he went home. So he wants his mom to hold on to his shirt, but basically he walked much faster after a while. And you can see the left knee is straight, the right knee is bending as he walks. But the left knee is a straight walking knee. And to me, having a straight knee that doesn't bend is not as good as having a bending knee. And there are his braces, yes, it was August of 2016, 12 years ago. So this is a little girl who's been through a journey, and I'm sure all of you know who she is. So basically, here's her board, she has bent knees, she has good trunk control, right? Here she is trying to walk with bent knees. I'm not saying you can't do it, but this is not functional when you become an adult. It's okay if you weigh 8 pounds, and you have your knees bent at 60 degrees, and you're trying to walk along in braces that hold you, but it's not truly functional. It's good, it's nice to do, but it's not functional. And her tears are trying to walk, she lets me show her face, but basically, she could barely walk and barely stand up. Does it make her less happy? But she can barely walk. I agree with that. Okay, so this is her knee bent. That's her knee not straightening. These are blocks to show that it doesn't extend here more than about 50 degrees. And that's right after straight. So the knee is straight. And that's her knee straight before I do the other side. So this is literally two weeks after surgery. And the knee is straight. And the knee bends. So can you learn to climb stairs? She's learning to climb stairs. It's hard to and she's going to bend her knee while she climbs the stairs using her quadricep so she does not wear braces. She must pass her and, and I don't have a recent video of her, but here's before, here this is now. This was four weeks after, and that was her walking four weeks after, and now she Run, go online and see running. Okay, but well, basically that is the process of doing this. And I think it is a revolution because you're taking techniques from the past and making them better and using techniques that can do that. So the foot is treated before or at the same time. And the foot, I think everybody is down, we know how to treat the foot. And here are all the things that I do, and I think this is very technical. There's no reason for me to talk about the technicalities. But I can show case after case. This is a boy in Israel, 90 degrees. This is right after surgery, straight, close your eyes. Okay, showing that I can actually move the tendon to give him quadriceps. Close your eyes still. This is the knee in surgery, close your eyes. That's the knee, right, disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. But my wife said, don't show these pictures. I said, but that's him afterwards. That's his knee, the same child, four weeks later. And he's bending his knee. He's straightening his knee, you can open your eyes, and he's moving his hip. Okay, and that's the scar. And I, I can't imagine how to scar, but I met Ward Madison the other day. If you want to get a scar, he loves them. Put a tattoo on him. You can either say mom or dad, because you're all lucky to have moms and dads who bring you these things. So I think it's either mom or dad, grandma or grandma who's bringing you here, but they deserve a lot of credit. So I think the first tattoo has got to be them, if they give you permission. Okay. I'm going to hear a lot of Okay. Well, just said I'm not allowed. Anyway, this is the problem. This is the problem that I see. I don't do this. Don't make a 90 degree angle at your hip and ruins your hip. And I have to, I've got to basically change it again. So I've got to bring it back. So 90 to treat hips. So here I am trying to fix the hip. At the same time, I'm trying to fix straighten the knee. Makes it much harder. And so, really, I think that is what you don't want to have to do. And here's me moving the knee again. In surgery, just show you two weeks after I have one, and I'm ready to do the other. Okay. Here's one done, and doing the other. Here's one done, and not done the other. That's both done, right in the outfit, right in surgery. And I usually do them two weeks apart. That's how I do it. There's one right before, that's during surgery, trying to be as less disgusting as possible. And this is the post-op management, two weeks of the cast, the five out, and right into a brace, which is fit in the operating room. And right away, we start range of motion. That's the key. Range of motion, range of motion, range of motion. We cannot lose range of motion. That's what we're here for. We're 
here for motion. We're not here for stiffness. Anybody, that's what, that's what God gave all of you, so we've got to get rid of it. We've got to get rid of the stiffness. That's our goal. Okay, the next slide, you may, I'm going to show you when, this is to be show you what it means by nerve releases. So this is a pterygium syndrome. This is the worst case of bent knee, right? 110 degrees, doesn't straighten at all, can't walk, can't do anything. He's a Bedouin who lives in the desert, um, in, I, think, I believe in Palestine, and basically that is his knee. And I treat, so I treat kids in Europe, in, in Israel, kids, both Arab and Israeli children, which actually the Israeli government pays for, and then, um, and then um, children from the Eastern Bloc. But basically, that's his knee before. That's his knee, right lying on his stomach. So just, that's his knee. That's me examining his knee. Okay, we still watch these pictures for a few more minutes. So this is the one time you actually can lengthen the skin itself. So here I'm actually lengthening the skin. So here's my plan to lengthen the skin. So you draw this out, and this lengthens 60%. So for the engineers out there, these are called seed plasties. And by transferring the skin, I can lengthen the skin 60% each time. Okay, for those of you who don't play those games, close your eyes. All right, so this is basically the, the wound open. But in a pterygium, that actually is the nerve. The nerve sits right underneath the skin. So you can't lengthen it. You can't lengthen a nerve. Because then the foot won't work and you won't be able to feel the foot. Right? And, the, and that, is, that is what happens. Keep your eyes closed, and basically, that is the nerve. So what do you do? Right? There actually is the nerve, sitting right out. Keep your eyes closed. Okay, open your eyes for a second. So basically, I did a release of everything. I released the joint, the soft tissues, the skin, and I went from here to here. That is all the length I could get. Okay? That's it. No more than that. And I think I went from 110 to maybe 70 degrees. That is not functional. Definitely close your eyes and say ready. Ready. Everybody ready? Ready. All right. That's what it looks like to shorten the femur bone, believe it or not. So the femur bones have been open, and I've actually put wires into this break, and I've shortened the femur so that I can actually straighten the leg. Okay, you can open your eyes. So basically, the leg is now going to be straight. And the, and the leg functions. So I go back a little bit, maybe 50 degrees, just let everything settle. And that's this boy, when I went back to visit him in Israel. He is straight and healed. And he bends 90 degrees. He goes from zero to 90 degrees. So I don't want to hear it can't be done. So that's him walking after I did one leg. This just happened. So he's, he's trying to walk around, he's very happy. He's trying to walk around with one leg. And he's still in therapy, so I had to mail me last night, of course, like I'm in the middle of the night, I'm like, I don't take videos unless I'm abroad, so I don't have any really recent videos. So here he is now walking and getting around. And this is only, I was just okay. So that is him, I was there in April. So that's April to July. That's pretty good. In four months, he went from non ambulatory to at least walking with a walker. He will walk in the middle. He definitely will. Okay, this is a work in progress. And I'm not, this is where I'm not going to make any claims. But I was actually speaking with Judith Paul about it, and that and Harold as well. The extension contraction, your knee is stuck in extension. There are things we can do. You know, I don't like operating on children usually before the age of three because of anesthesia. But this may be one we should operate on very, very young, before the knee becomes flat. There are solutions to this, but often the knee becomes stiff again. And it becomes stiff because the cartilage becomes flat. So we may, we may have to find a different solution for these knees being bent, for preventing these knees. But basically they can be dislocated, or they can be not dislocated. But basically we definitely have ways of getting them from dislocated to 40 degrees. The question is, how do we get them to 90 degrees? I don't know if I have a full answer to that yet. I thought I did. I thought I did. And we're working on it, and actually, um, that'll be for the conference in Philadelphia in September, a true conversation for the international conference. But it can be done. What about your hip doesn't flex? Well, I'll tell you this right away. If your hip doesn't flex, 
at all. And it stuck lying down. Don't let someone fuse your child's spine. Because then, he can't sit the child. So, we've got to come up with a solution to get the hip to bend. And we certainly are working on that. I have now a child who just came up from Utah. That, I, that is, a, is a long, and I don't have time for that now, because I've been speaking already for 30 minutes. But basically, that is a problem that can be fixed with doing, there's, there's different things you can do to be able to sit. The problem is, how do you make someone be able to sit and walk if they're stuck in extension? And there you've got to do a very large release behind the hip. And then there are, there's ways of saving the artery to the hip. We didn't think we could do that, but it can be done. So I'm invited next year, I give a talk on how to get hip extension contractures to actually flex and actually get them to walk afterwards. But I want to spend the last 10 minutes and then take questions on it afterwards on upper extremity, because I think that's where I'm going to show very few pictures and I want to talk about it. So there's two components of upper extremity, right? The most important is obviously functional. And I wrote, you know, that, that's above cosmetics, but cosmetics matter. Because, for instance, let's say, what's the most important muscle in the upper extremity for function? Well, it's obviously the biceps muscle, right? The biceps muscle makes a, makes a person able to grab something at the table, and able to eat. Now, I've seen all the, we all know the tricks, right? Bring your arm across, go like this, bend down to the table, it's all great. But on the first date, I would like the man or the woman to be able to put a fork on it and be able to eat it without putting their mouth to the table so the date goes well. And hopefully they can find on Tinder. <laughs> but basically, um, the, so cosmetics do matter. And so how do we get biceps muscles? I'm going to show you in a second. But the most important thing is that one, if we're going to do with both arms, then one arm really should be for eating, right? And one arm should be used for taking care of what comes out after you. You need one for caring for yourself and one for eating. We're not going to make it fully functional, but we better leave one for caring for yourself and one for eating, for dressing, for dependence. And that's what we really have to think about. But we can't give up on cosmetics because, for instance, what's one muscle we use for biceps? And this is where we've forgotten, right? Because I'm the second generation past polio. All the surgeons who treated polio are gone. They're either in, they're lucky if they're in old age homes, and most of them have passed on. And so there are these procedures that have been forgotten. So, you know, I met Ward Madison, many of you know him, Scar now. So, Scarman had pectoralis major transfers for, and he allowed me to talk about him, so this is not him. In fact, the opposite. It's promotion. So basically, um, he has a pectoral pectoralis major is the muscle in your breast for man or woman, right? In an old radical mastectomy, they would take out a woman's pectoralis major during a radical mastectomy. But the scar from radical mastectomy, the scar from transferring the pectoralis major, is straight across the breast, or straight underneath the breast. So it's quite significant for a woman to undergo a pectoralis major transfer because you're losing your breast muscle. So is that worth it or not? It's a good question. I mean, that's not my answer. I can't give that answer. But it's certainly, so that's why I wrote cosmetics do matter. But there are other muscles we can transfer. If, if it depends upon what you have. You have the latissimus dorsi. That's a really good muscle to use. And the, and the generation of surgeons doing this have been forgotten. So I've dedicated 2018 to, believe it or not, reading articles from 1930 to 1945. That was the basically the polio epidemic in America. And that's when these surgeons, that's all the surgeons did. They knew nothing about polio. All they did was transfer muscles for polio. Arthrogryposis is like polio. I mean, it's a paralysis of the muscle. Now, polio didn't get the stiffness that arthrogryposis had, but I can loosen any joint, almost any joint. I can make it loose, but I can't bring muscle in. So how do we get, how do we get muscle in where we don't have it? So I'm going to say that we've got to go back to the 1930s. And we have to stop thinking about straightening the wrists just because they're bent. Who cares? They're, they're a fork. Fork isn't straight, right? I mean, fork has a time for a reason. It's easy. If your fork was straight, you'd be feeding your deer. 
Okay? It's really hard to eat with a straight fork. The reason a fork has a bend to it, I mean, for those of us who cheat at barbecues, we do eat with a straight fork. But most of us don't. Most of us eat with a fork that's bent. So if your wrist is a little bent or even 30 degrees bent, that actually may be more functional in eating. So we have to be really careful when we straighten the wrist or don't straighten the wrist. Now, sometimes you straighten them because if you take your own hand and you try to use your hand bent, it's much weaker than if you use it when it's up. That's not always true for arthrogyposis. you got to test that. Sometimes arthrogyposis kids or adults are stronger when their wrist flex than they are when they're straight. So you can't take a cerebral palsy issue and make it an arthrogyposis issue. You can't overlap them. They are not the same disease. And so everybody, yes, I straighten a lot of wrists in, in, in cerebral palsy, and I will straighten many fewer wrists in arthrogyposis. So I think we have to be very careful when we do that. Think about it. how we're going to gain that function. What about a free muscle transfer? Well, you know what the problem with free muscle transfers are, really, this day and age? It's insurance. And then you can't get a plastic surgeon to want to do it because insurance won't pay for it. So literally, and they're the ones who do these, because it takes eight hours to do. It's a difficult operation to steal a muscle from one place and bring it somewhere else. Every parent has said to me, just take mine. It's fine. Just take mine. Take my, take my abdominal muscle. Take my hamstring. You can use mine. That may be an issue someday. Maybe we can do that, but not yet. But basically, that's another answer. And then taking the muscle from your, the, the chest wall or from the side still works and can make a biceps work. So it's not just about releasing it. And I read a review article recently on arthrogyposis, and I circled everything I disagreed with. And about 85% of the article I disagreed with. And one was, you can't make an elbow function in arthrogyposis. That is nonsense. So again, I'll show you videos. You can make an elbow flex with using muscles. They do it in brachial plexus, they did it in polio, and you can do it in arthrogyposis. Okay, and so that's my, my uh, setting on my, my, my box talking about upper extremity, and again, be careful about extending wrists. Okay, so I think we need to look back at the polio generation if we're going to look forward, but we also have to look forward. So I'm going to, five, I'm going to tell you about something I learned because, so prosthetics is a huge industry in the world and in America. Huge because obviously the federal government gives you know, grants for prostheses because of the army. Huge because it's an incredible industry with billions of dollars poured into the prosthetic industry. There aren't billions of dollars being poured into arthrogyposis. But this is the, that's going to be the future. So if you want the future of what we're ending up doing, we're going to target muscle reinnervation. If we could make artificial hips and artificial knees, and we could make a prosthetic work, we have a sensate hand. I mean, arthrogyposis can feel normally. It just can't motor it normally. So if we can get it to move passively, there are ways of doing target muscle reintegration. I went to courses when I was in Europe on this. They're doing amazing things with prosthetics. So the next wave over the next decade, and what I hope what I'm saying like Judith Hall is here and talking about how I used to work, it's going to be this targeted muscle reintegration. We're going to take a nerve, like the musculocutaneous nerve, fancy word for the nerve to the biceps. We're going to create an artificial muscle and a muscle from somewhere else. And we're going to target it to what moves fingers, what moves pinch, what brings the hands up. So if we can passively move it, and actually from microprocessors, and we can implant microprocessors. So all of this, that is the future. It's not being done yet, but if you ask me, Right now, I want to just start muscle transfers. We should get back to doing them. They work. But the targeted muscle reinnervation of bringing the prosthetic generation to the arthrogrypotic population is where our future is going to be. And I don't think it's that far off. Because if you, there are some people in Austria doing amazing work on this targeted muscle reinnervation of soldiers who've lost limbs. And their ability to play piano with their prosthetic arms. So there's no reason why we can't do that first. And what's the problem with the prosthetic arm? You can't feel it. They don't want to use it, right? But if you can't feel your arm, it's, it's much easier to use the end of the stump than to use the arm, to use the fingers. You want to feel it. But in arthritis, you feel everything. So if we 
to be hyperflated. So basically, the um, uh, the reinnovation of this is possible. I want to go back to one thing that I think I was talking about nerves and then skipped over it. So I'm just going to go back to one slide, which is not very pretty. So if you didn't like the uh, if you didn't like that picture, close your eyes again. So what you see here is how tight these nerves are. If you don't tighten, if you don't shorten a string, if you don't shorten the guitar string, it's just going to hurt and not function. And so you have to loosen it so it has no tightness at the end. In my future are my grandchildren, who are standing over here. <laughs> and I thank you for giving me the time to speak, and I'd be happy to answer any questions uh, you have. Do what's called a pedicle. So the nerve still stays attached and it gets rotated on the nerve. So the question was, how can you take the muscle that needs its nerve to work, but you actually leave the nerve attached to it and you rotate it on its pedicle, which is called the nerve and blood supply to it. And that's actually known, that's not something new at all. And it's done. When you do a free muscle transfer, you actually hook up the nerve that's local to that and it works to, excuse me, to a certain degree. And that is really a um, it regenerates it's a very short distance. So nerve regeneration matters on distance. If you can make it a very short distance, it can work. Even if you cut it and take it to a new nerve. And brachial plexus surgeons, people who injure their brachial, which is the, uh, the nerves under the arm, let's say from a grabbing injury on a train or whatever, they've done that also for years. Right, so what if they have an anterior horn cell disease and they don't have that enough? Like, you obviously have to choose the nerve that's functional. You can, you can get that. I mean, you have to use a nerve that is functional, right? I mean, you can't take a nerve that's not functional. And there are, that's why I started this conversation by saying, we all know that AMC is a spectrum. And there are some people who I can't find the muscle to transplant or don't have a nerve. But, you know, there, but many times, you can even use a sensory nerve to act as a motor nerve, and it can be relearned. So it's amazing to see start numbing up. So it's amazing what they're doing with these prosthetic arms. I think that's, that's why I said it as a future, and not as a present. Sure, a follow-up. They're incredibly expensive, they're cost-prohibitive right now, 
but basically they go on and they can basically preserve the arm and they, again, through a microprocessor, and again, they're firing in place, they can hook up to a nerve that's in the neck or somewhere else, and you learn, you relearn what to fire. When, when, they, when they talk about my, I was just reading these articles from the 30s, when people first learn, let's say you transfer a picture out of the which does this, you know, it's a He-Man, it's a He-Man muscle, right? It brings, brings your leg arms together. Yes, yeah, so every time you want to eat, you've got to go like this, and you'll throw the food in your face, right? But you actually learn, you relearn. So they actually relearn to do it. An exoskeleton does work. It's a lot of training. It's not a simple thing to utilize. And it hasn't become widely used, I think, because of cost prohibition, number one. And also, if you're using it on your legs, it probably takes three hours to get dressed in the morning. How many hours in a day do people have? So is there anybody in the United States working on a microprocessor? I don't know. I saw it in Europe, you know. Um, I, will, I know that they're working on it in the Army. I know that Walter Reed's working on it. That's the main place right now. It's all through Army grants. Um, and as it becomes a female, as it becomes available, and as this becomes more information, I, I will let you. I'm certainly going to be on top of it. It's something I'm just learning about. Um, and I think that, that but to me, that is not the present, but it's the future. But uh, we're really excited about it, actually, in many ways. So it's something I'll know about in the next six months. I'll know much more. About. No, go ahead. Um, so, as far so a lot of what I understand is that there's imbalance between like muscle groups, front, back. You know, difference between your your bicep and your tricep, um, pecs versus you know the back muscles. Um, is there anything that you found that helps to, to address the, the back muscles to bring the shoulders up rather than having them kind of fall? Well, so the question was the balance. You know, the question is that it's all about balance. The problem is that's much more true about cerebral palsy than it is about. Um, I'm going to answer the question in two points. Sure. The balance part is much more an issue of cerebral palsy where what, when both muscles are firing, but one is overpowering the other. In orthogrypposis, one muscle is firing, the other one doesn't exist. Right? It doesn't so exist at it's all. Not, it's just not even there, it's scar tissue. So that's the imbalance, right? So, you know, how do you get the protracted shoulders? The question was, how do you get the shoulders that say, you know, they're really far forward, and how do you move them back? And that's almost impossible muscularly right now to do that. And I, I don't think it's, but obviously there are, you know, again, now we're, People lengthen clavicles to bring it up the, the you know, collarbones to bring your shoulders back. Obviously, I mean, you put the humerus, which is the shoulder, the fourth, the arm in a better position, so it's not so internally rotated and it's not so far forward. Um, so you try to balance it out, but there, the, the problem is not imbalance, the problem doesn't exist. So you've got to take a muscle, so you can lay, I mean, I feel like the other woman asked, you've got to sort of write down which muscles are functioning right. and what you're going to use to protract the, the shoulder. You can. You can add the lat latissimus, which is often working in kids, and you can hook it up to the scapula on the side to retract the scapula. So, and again, that was written about for the polio, because they fused the shoulder made the polio patients. Because I'm thinking about, you were, you were talking about blood flow, and you were talking about nerve, um, and, and I was just thinking if, if this could be back, then you might have better blood flow, you might have better nerve conductivity. Yeah, I mean, there's no question that bringing the shoulders back would help people with their posture and help people getting new arms out of their, out of their lap. So I'm not sure if it would help bring nerve, more nerve supply to them, but I think the more we can get people upright, the more they can use things they don't think they have. And one thing I did find is, you know, I showed you, I showed you quickly my classification for the knee. So 1A means that the, the knee is flexible in 45 degrees, but they have quadriceps. So 1B, they can't kick, they have no quadriceps. So many times, I think they have no ability to kick. I strengthen the knee, and all of a sudden they kick. So I don't understand that. I'm not going to claim credit for it, because I didn't do anything. But for some reason, whatever you've opened up, whatever what you call a channel, or you've allowed the muscle now not to be, you know, to be at a length that works, most likely. But something's happening that allows us to do it. There's something there, right? Right. There may be. There may be. I mean, I've been inside, but there's sometimes there's nothing there. There are many. My, my daughter has straight arms and she had an elbow release and she now well, exactly. what couldn't, she couldn't use at all before and now she... Well, I mean, I, I see little babies who tell me, they tell me he's never going to bend their elbow. Never. You're never going to bend your elbow. And all I see is a flicker and I know they're going to be fine. There's a flicker. Right. That flicker is all you need. Anybody else? Yes.
I'm sorry. Go ahead. How easy is it for any orthopedic to replicate with a large amount? Is there extension, extensive um, training required? And how, where could I direct our orthopedics to learn about what we've done? I would invite anybody down to our center, that's for sure. I think that we are going to have more therapeutic meetings at some point in the next couple of years, but anybody can email me, any surgeon can email me. We have visitors all the time. They can scrub in, they can watch. Um, and no, I don't think, I mean, I don't think the only part that I think that orthopedic surgeons are scared about is this nerve part. But you know, the thing is, I we like the legs, so I release the nerve, I loosen up. Tissues around the memory of the nerve that's out of the nerve three times a week. So I'm not scared of the nerve. You don't need a neurosurgeon to release the nerve. But it is released. It's not released off of anything, it's just free. So the kid, because the first one I did, the kid woke up screaming with nerve pain. Screaming. So I, I learned this the hard way because I didn't shorten it up. And I put him on gabapentin and nerve cup, and eventually he got better. But three months later, he looks at me and cries still. But um, basically, it is not, I don't think anything I'm doing is not learnable. I think I just need real surgeons because they've got to be able to do open surgery and want to do big surgery. Then they can't be arthroscopy surgeons. But if they're good orthopedic surgeons who know how to operate, this is not rocket science. I'm not using anything that they can't afford to use. I'm not using the equipment that it costs $300. It's nothing. It just takes three hours and we need. Some bit of gut, they're not going to do that and do a lot of it because if you haven't done it a lot, it's very hard to do. It's very hard. To, it's a scary place to be. The surgery itself takes three hours. No, not three hours. Now, now I do my point is about an hour and twenty minutes now, but I started to three now. I'm sorry. I actually had. After going um, international, actually, and coming overseas to Dr. Feldman and he checked her and said she's going to be 100%, we're going to make her 100%. And from there, came with his staff, she had had surgeries, big surgeries, and all that, but it was amazing. And she's walking around using her arms as regular as possible. So I can't say you're here, Dr. Feldman, you cannot stand up and publicly say thank you. Yeah, so that's a great question. The question was, are there any 
advances in stem cell research in doing this. You know, stem cell is a rat, right? I mean, it's a rat. That's that right now. Doesn't mean it doesn't work in some circumstances, but you know, there's no good studies that show it, right? Could I inject fat and make a muscle that works? No. Could I? Could I take it? Or could I give? If you had an arthritic ankle or arthritic knee as an adult, and give you stem cell in your joint and buy you some time of pain free? Yeah, I can. That's where stem cells have impact because they grow cartilage. So, you know, I, I'll tell you an example. I was I, I, this international thing. I think really helps us understand. So there's a group in Cyprus who's injecting spinal cord injuries with stem cells into the spinal cord. The FDA will allow us to do that. Personally, if I was a complete spinal cord injury, go ahead and inject. You know, I mean, why not? Well, you can get an infection, okay? Treat the infection. I mean, I think that at that point, why not, right? So, and they're claiming results in Cyprus. So, next time I'm in Israel, I'm flying to Cyprus to see if that's true or not. But there are some, you know, anecdotal stories, and you got to look in weird places, like places in Russia, places in Cyprus. I mean, people are allowed to do things without the FDA regulating them. We're trying now. A lot of bad goes on, so you gotta be careful. And it's a lot of money and charlatanry going on. But we're looking, and we are looking all over for that moment where we can say, where can stem cell grow? Where can stem cell play the role? But again, like the future of you know these microprocessors, that's not there yet. David, there's a question from this woman, and she asks if there's an age where you can act out of treatments. No, I mean, because everything, there's no age where you can't have something, right? I mean, you're 60 years old, learning through hypnosis, you have arthritic knee, why can't you have a knee replacement? You know, get it to move better. Why can't you have a total hip? I mean, why should you be? No, there's no age. And it's always my age plus 10 anyway, so. <laughs> So I put that in there, and I didn't, I'm not a physical therapist, so I didn't spend much time at Easton and all the rest of the modalities, and, you know, and, and all the different ways you can get muscles that are there but weak to work. And I'll answer yes to all of them. You know, I mean, you can always do so many modalities in your life, but yes, I think Easton, Easton, you know, I mean, all these things have a bit of an impact. Chiropractic, I mean, all of it, all of it can do can do some good. I don't know exactly how much, but I know that certainly without them. We're not getting anywhere. If I just do what I do without physical therapy, I'm like, we're not getting anywhere. So the answer is yes, but I'm not sure exactly how much. David, first of all, congratulations on using the word functionality, because I think that's a, something parents certainly fear, uh, not hearing enough from the doctors that they, they go to. Secondly, are you of concerns that you're studying more in the 30s and early 40s from the polio doctors who are no longer with us? What you're studying, how do you pass that on to the next generation of doctors coming up? Well, I mean, I think you do what we're doing, which is that I have, before I got out of here, I mean, I think that this went out on social media before I had my results, right? I mean, and that's the problem with social media, right? I think that, so now I'm presenting it. So I collected my data. I'm presenting it next week in San Francisco at the International Wind Lightning and Reconstruction Society. Hopefully there will be surgeons there here and then want to learn it. I'm presenting it again in Philadelphia at the end of September at the Orthopedic meeting. And then I'll publish, this will be published in one of the journals. And then people will want to learn it. And that's the only way we can press our word on it. But things are forgotten. But yes, you tried. I mean, I have, I trained, what's 12 times, 20, 240 residents and you know, and 20 fellows in my life uh, when I was at NYU. So I certainly have, but I think this is now a change where we have to get it out there. And that's why I'm here. And I'm, and I'm, I'm humble enough to know that I'm not there yet. It'll keep changing. And in five years, I'll say something else. But at least I think, you know, for certain things, I've gotten to the point where I'm at least quasi happy. I can say I'm happy with quasi happy. Well, I would have to say one thing you won't change in five years is using that word functionality because that is so important. And again, thank you for using that. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? All right, great. Oh, one more. That's my wife working, by the way. I don't see a lot about Um, 
function and um, more function. The arm can get up more closer to the base for self care. And in case I know it's not a concern, we're all in the but for ours it is. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And I'm not a shoulder expert, but I, I probably think it will be. But um, I agree with you. I think that the question, I think the upper extremity is getting ignored. I really do. I think it's ignored, and as Rich was saying, functionally it's getting ignored. Um, the shoulder, getting the shoulder forward elevated, which is what you're talking about, if it doesn't have any muscle forward elevated, has been said to be impossible. That's what they say, that you can't get a shoulder. But the only thing you lack, I mean, what do you lack if you can't do that? So you lack the ability to wash your hair, brush your hair. I know, and I'm well aware. But for, for a father who brushed three daughters' hair in his entire life, he never brushed their hair until they were, I don't know, I'm not sure they still do now, in 30, 26, 24. They have husbands who can do it. But I, don't, I, I hear you, and I know that, and I think that that is a question that we're looking into, because it's all part of the elbow flexion. Because elbow flexion, without some ability to raise your arm and your shoulder, I don't think we'll ever get it over the head. But if we can get it at least up a little bit, it'll make a difference what you can do on your face. And yes, it's very, very important, I agree. And it's part of what we're looking at. It not releases, it. it's finding a muscle that can replace the rotator cuff, and finding a muscle that can replace the deltoid. Which, you know, some of them are smart. They did that, you know, I can not mention polio. They did it, they used this muscle in the neck to do it. And again, cosmetics versus if you lose this muscle in your neck, which is called, this is the one that gives you the V in your neck when you look at someone, it's scarring. So, but it's why it is, but it is something that people have done before, and I think that we need to look into it. Um, and think about it. the entire upper extremity as a unit, and I, I can't agree more with the word function because just straightening your wrist is not functioning your wrist. It's just straightening your wrist. And if that's not going to make you function better, then why are you straightening it? I don't understand it. It doesn't make any sense. Unless you have a comprehensive plan for the upper extremity and time. Like, if you just, if loosening the elbow is important because you can use your other arm, but what's the, what's the comprehensive plan? Are you going to transfer the triceps? Well, why are you loosening them and then not transfer them the same day? Because they're going to ruin, ruin them. So why are you ruining them and they're not transferring? So there's so much being done today I don't understand. And I'm happy to argue with the surgeon doing it, but they've got to give me an answer. Because they're not giving me an answer. I've asked the same question. Well, because that's the way it's done. But why? Why are we doing that? Why are we staging an elbow to release it? Well, because it'll get a little bit stiff in flexion. Okay, but if the other arm is always straight, maybe that's okay if that's the arm they're using for everything else. And if you tell the family that and the child that, they may lose a little bit of extension. And if they do, I prefer to have another arm that I can, one arm that I can use everything with to my face and one arm that I can do everything straight with. And if you speak to a lot of adults with arthritis grandposis, none of them like that. Oh, many of them have that. One arm for one thing and one arm for something else. And those are, to me, the most functional adult patients with arthritis Sorry, one other question. I have the light in my Joint replacement? Is this something joint replacement? Uh, like a uh, joint replacement? Absolutely. Is that, that is not crazy talk at all. And I didn't talk about that because I want to be rude off the stage. But one of the reasons knees don't bend in extension contractures is because even if I can get it to bend in the operating room, the joint is flat. So why don't we at age 12, right? And then I just heard from Judith Hall the genetics changes over ages, which blew my mind because I got to get to for lunch. But basically, um, and even in a single patient, the genetics changes, which I know I But basically, yeah, so why not, like you do in a tumor, like it's a kid who has cancer, release the knee, give them a new round knee, and let it bend and work if they have the muscles to do it. 100%. I've done it for Larson syndrome. You know what? It works just fine. I've done it, I've done it for post-trauma. It works just fine. I've never done it for arthropathosis, and I promise I will in the next, in the next year I will do it in a 12 or 13 year old, I will give them a total knee replacement and I will loosen up the same way I loosened it up and it won't get stiff because of the fact A, the genetics may be different. I think the extended knees, I may have to bite the bullet and operate very, very, very young on those children and get their knees bending. Those with that, either, or just wait till they're 12 or 13. So, I mean, I think we're still figuring out part of that, but yes, but there's nothing wrong with the joint replacement. What's the lifespan of the joint replacement? It depends on the, I mean, the level of activity. Yeah, so if you're Bo Jackson and you're, uh, you know, you're running footballs and baseballs, it lasts, you know, eight years. But if you're a patient with arthritis and you just want to basically go to your school dance, 
you know, and walk and walk down the hall without walk down the hall, it could last you 20, 30 years. And you know what? If you change the line or it's called polyethylene, once in a while, it'll last so you go in every eight years for a polyethylene change, like a like a car, it'll last even a lot longer. So I'm not an expert on joint replacements, and I have someone who works with me who is, and they can come into these custom made joint, it's like a Tom Myers thing, he joins us too from Harvard, and basically he does these custom made ear replacements. So it's actually fitting with the CAT scan exactly the size. And if it lasts 12 years, 15 years, I think that's pretty good, you know, until you get a new one. So um, I'd like to ask about the lower strategies and the hips. Did I understand you to say that there is not an age um, limitation on when some um, improvement functionally would occur? Higher or lower age? Absolutely. There's no age. Look, okay, I mean, if someone has atherosclerosis disease, like cardiac disease, and I'm stretching a blood vessel, I'm not doing that because I'm talking about someone in their 50s, 60s, 70s. But I mean, we talk about someone who's, a, who's 15, 25, 30 years old, there's no reason why. And I have to tell this anecdotal story, which is one patient who knows her, but we met this patient, 17, junior in high school, is a, what I call a 1A, process work function just bent knees and is in a wheelchair. And the mother will not let me fix the knees. That's the only patient where I disagree with her. I usually never come into something like surgery. I try and I think things come out. No, there's no real issue. So 28, 29 is not a thing? No. Flexion and contractures, knees and hips. There's no issue. And that age is not there. You have one? Oh, that's the one. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, they did soft tissue releases on my knees when I was like three. And um, it worked like a little bit, but like, the contractions came back. So I'm intrigued, I guess, by what you guys are saying, but it would still be possibility into function, even though I got the wedding and an older and pretty sweet and all that. So I'll answer that the confounding factor to us. So an Escobar actually is, is actually you, I know you're going to find it to believe, it's actually a people. Because Escobar has great muscles, as opposed to arthrogrophosis. So unlike arthrogrophosis, which loses muscles because maybe anterior horn cells, so whatever reason you can call will tell us, I heard it's 400 genes with 22 pathways, which I cannot make but that's how many. So it's 400 genes involved in arthrogrosis and 22 pathways. That's insane, actually. But the bigger problem is, you know, lung function. is the cardiac, the, 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 the spine, the lung function, and other confounding morbidities with patients with diseases, such as syndrome we're talking about. I'm not talking about any person who knows it, and you can talk to me in private, but but basically, so yes, the answer is, with Escobar syndrome, there's no reason why a 28-year-old, is a generic answer, I'm not speaking about it, there's no reason why a 28-year-old, with otherwise healthy Escobar syndrome, who has to reach the eye, cannot be treated the same way that an 8-year-old can be treated in, in, with that disease. I think a lot more to deal with, but it will happen. Okay, guys, well, thanks for staying, thanks for listening, and have a great time.